is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Paul Barber. Our top stories. China's leaders pay tribute to Jiang Zemin at a memorial for the late president in Beijing. And other headlines. China's capital opens up. Beijing becomes the latest city to ease COVID restrictions following Shanghai, Guangzhou and Chongqing. Visiting the front line, Ukraine's president travels to Donetsk amid heavy fighting in the east. A large fire breaks out at a Russian airbase after it was hit by a drone attack. The third strike on a Russian airfield in two days. And Morocco are playing Spain as the neighbours and rivals fight it out in the last 16 of the World Cup. A process of easing COVID restrictions is now well underway in China, with rules being refined or even dropped in many cities across the country following three years of strict zero-COVID policy. Beijing has become the latest major city to ease the rules, following Shanghai, Chongqing and Guangzhou. Residents are now allowed to enter public parks, supermarkets and offices without a negative test. But testing will remain for now at venues such as schools, gyms and care homes. Guangzhou is China's fifth largest city by population and a major hub for industry, transport and technology. Restrictions were eased there over the weekend. Our correspondent Omar Khan has been assessing the impact of those changes. It's been a golf-like difference. You compare today to just around a week, uh, roughly a week ago, and it's a massive difference. We can start with PCR testing. Officials, health officials in the city now saying that those, te those tests, I should say, will not be done in a sporadic way. They will only be done when needed. And you think of those PCR kiosks that have lined the streets of China for the last three years, you're seeing less and less of those here in Guangzhou. Not to say that they're all gone, there's still one in the community I live in, but a lot of that sort of onus and responsibility shifting onto the hospitals who are also installing fever clinics in the ones that are not there. Now, as for those 48-hour to 24-hour negative tests that usually we had to present when entering nearly any venue, that's also been scrapped here in the city for roughly a week. And only a green code is needed, and that's pretty easy to have at the moment. So anywhere you go, be it a restaurant, be it your office building, a gym, any sort of shopping mall, entertainment complex, those places are filling up again with people. You have to remember the city, roughly one month of struggle here, the recent outbreak. That is not to say that's over. That is still continuing, and officials are tweaking, are optimizing uh, their response. More in Guangzhou is that transportation has more or less uh, come back to a sort of regular sort of uh, situation. Movement between districts uh, is flowing, be it metro, be it buses. Uh, and none of the districts uh, in Guangzhou are under any sort of major lockdown or closed loop management. Uh, so again, that is a good step forward uh, as we move in to the winter. Now, at today's health uh, presser, officials announcing 3,371 new cases as of midnight last night. Again, that's not to say it's been completely dealt with, but this new sort of approach to COVID-19 uh, is, is trying to look at how to ensure that regular daily life of the people across this major city continues in a normal way, and that we can get back to having those face-to-face -face meetings, can go out with family, go out with friends, and sort of fo uh, focus uh, all that medical attention on the people that need it. And one more thing to add is, yesterday I spoke with one individual who is COVID-19 positive. She's in the district of Haiju. And she was actually given a phone call by local health authorities and given an option if she wanted to self-isolate at home. That's obviously the decision she made. She's comfortably there, taking that responsible onus on herself, uh, doing the tests that are being brought to her door, and of course, trying to keep healthy and stay indoors. So again, we're going in that good direction here in Guangzhou, and hopefully that's something we see across other parts of the country. New figures published in the UK say more than 200,000 people were lost to the workforce in the first half of the year as a result of long COVID. 
It's thought this could partially explain why Britain's labour force has shrunk so much since the pandemic began. It comes after a U.S. report estimated the lingering effects of the virus could ultimately bring an economic cost of more than $3.7 trillion over the long term. Karsten Bajewski is the global head of macro at ING Bank. I asked him about the impact of long COVID on the global economy. I think in, in all honesty, there, we, there, is still, there is still more that we don't know about long COVID than what, that is what we do know. Um, so... But when you look at labor markets, uh, when you look at now the aftermath of the kind of you know, first two years of COVID, we do see that there are people still um, suffering under under this long COVID, and it has clear implications for the way they can work or they cannot work. It has an important implication for the labor market, particularly in times in which um, the labor market is already under enormous tension as we're having a lack of qualified workers all over the Western world. Clearly, governments have had to spend a lot more on medical costs. But are there other longer-term concerns, or will many of these issues simply resolve themselves? Well, there are definitely longer-term uh, concerns. It's not only long COVID, but to also think about the uh, psychological um, effect that uh, the lockdowns have had on people. Um, so social isolation, loneliness, that is also something that, uh, that will have actually economic costs uh, to, uh, to countries, to societies. And, and it's simply too early to tell how high these costs really are, but obviously the longer term implications. So not only by COVID itself, but also they call them second round effects, lockdowns, social isolation, um, be, being, being on a distance um, is, is really having an enormous impact on societies and will also take, I think it will, will take years for societies to readjust and will also have people actually who will suffer in, for, for longer, a longer period from these implications. And as you said in your previous answer, there's still more we don't know about long COVID than we do know. And at present, there's still no medical consensus on what the nature of the condition is um, or what, how best to treat it. Uh, could new innovations like flexible hybrid remote working actually help to mitigate this uncertainty? I think all, all innovations um, that uh, somehow make human contact less likely, mm -hmm. yeah, even though it also can have repercussions in, in the form of loneliness, um, but, um, but, but, but to avoid really overly crowded places in times of uh, a virus burst out, um, in, in, in terms of an, another kind of yes, sickness getting, getting into a region or a country would clearly help. Um, so social distancing definitely helps. But as we learned also from, the, from psychologists, it is that uh, social distancing also at the cost. And I think that is the whole, that is the big challenge for people in charge, for politicians, for governments to, to balance um, the risks and the benefits from social distancing, from lockdowns for society and the entire economy. The resurgence in air travel following the pandemic will see the sector return to profit next year, according to airlines. The International Air Transport Association expects firms to make combined net profits of $4.7 billion in 2023, with more than 4 billion passengers set to fly. Airlines lost tens of billions of dollars in 2020 and 2021 as international travel all but ground to a halt. Australia's central bank has raised its interest rate by a quarter percentage point to 3.1%, its highest level in a decade. It's the eighth consecutive monthly rise. The bank said it expects to tighten policy further as it seeks to cool Australia's hottest inflation in 30 years. The European Union has agreed a new law to prevent companies from selling commodities linked to deforestation into the EU market. Coffee, beef and soy are among the commodities affected. Companies will need to verify where their goods were produced and prove they were not grown on land deforested after 2020 or face hefty fines. Meta has threatened to remove US-related news content from Facebook if lawmakers pass a controversial journalism bill. The law, which has bipartisan support, could make it easier for news outlets to negotiate fees for content shared on Facebook. Meta insists platform provides increased traffic to struggling news outlets. 
U.S. President Joe Biden is traveling to Arizona, where he'll visit the Taiwan Semiconductor Company's chip-making plant. Biden's expected to use the visit to push his administration's economic plan and promote efforts to boost technology manufacturing. Let's speak to our correspondent, John Terrett, at the New York Stock Exchange. John, good to see you. Uh, on his way to Arizona, Thank a presidential you, visit, always a big deal. Yep. Yes. You're absolutely right. And this is a real star-studded event as well, Paul and Andrew. Com in business terms anyway. It's not a Hollywood star-studded event, but if you're interested in business, the guests there today are going to be quite something to see. Let me give you a list. How about Apple CEO Tim Cook? He's going to turn up in Phoenix, Arizona. So too is Morris Chang. He's the founder of one of the world's biggest microchip makers, if not the biggest, which is the one we're talking about principally today, TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Company. Also present, Sanjay Marotra, who's the head of Micron Technologies, which is based in Utah, in the northwest of the country, and Jensen Huang, who is the CEO of NVIDIA, based in California, and they make microchips primarily for the video game and gaming industry. They do other things as well, but primarily for that. So this is a real business A-list. And of course, the president is flying down there as well. And it's a very, very important day for him as well. Because if you remember the supply chain issue, which seemed to center, because so much of our world is computerized these days, seemed to center on a complete lack of microchips one or two years ago. It happened on his watch. And he was very conscious of that and has been taking steps, including the recent CHIPS Act, which we'll mention again in just a second, to try and stop that from ever happening again, certainly in North America. Now, the big news of the day is that Taiwan Semiconductor is going to announce a major investment in the United States. Now, they already have a factory which they're busy completing in Phoenix, Arizona, in the southwest of the country. But today they will announce that they're going to triple their planned investment. This is, I think, the biggest inward investment from a foreign company ever in the United States to $40 billion. They're going to have a second factory down there in Phoenix. And today they're going to have what they call, after the speeches, they're going to have what they call a tulip. Now, Andrew, I have been reporting business news for the last 25 years, more. And in that time, I've never heard of a tooling. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> they're going to have one. I think what it is, you know when you build a tall building, and you get the local mayor to come around and put the last brick in place and cement it in place? They call that a topping out. And they do that a lot with tall buildings when they're built. And I think what a tooling is, is that you, br you wheel in literally the first bit of equipment that will begin the production line. So I th that's what they're going to do in the sunshine of, of Arizona today, Andrew. Well, clearly, John, the president wants his name all over this. I mean, where does that leave U.S. chip production? Right. Fairly weak, has to be said. Not good, but Biden's trying to do something about that as the president. At the moment, the U.S. produces about 12 percent of the global microchip market, 12 percent. Now, the thing is, it was much more than that. 20 years ago in the 1990s and the late 80s, it was much more like 37 or 40 percent. So it's down significantly since then. And just to put this into perspective, Taiwan, which is the country we're talking about here, this is where Taiwan Semiconductor is actually based all over that island. They produce 21 percent of the world's chips at the moment. And China is the major producer, producing just over a quarter of them. Now, there are concerns. It's not all smooth sailing for the present because there are concerns about the relationship between Taiwan and China, which we don't need to go into right now. But there are worries among some in the business community that Biden is going to be relying too heavily on a Taiwan-based company when there are issues between Beijing and Taipei. That's why the $52 billion CHIP Act has been brought in, as far as the Americans are concerned, in the last couple of months. It's designed to make sure that there is no chip shortage in the U.S. ever again. And Biden is going to say today that with Taiwan Semiconductor coming in, they are bringing advanced semiconductor production back to United States soil. That's going to be his main message. And John, while we've got you, how are the markets looking today? Not very good today, Andrew, I'm afraid to say. Problem is that we've got a couple of key dates looming up in the markets 
are worrying once again about inflation and interest rates and whether the Federal Reserve is on top of it or not and what that interest rate hike in oh, just over a week's time is going to be. The two key dates are CPI, which is consumer inflation, what Americans pay at the gas stations and the stores over last month and over last year. That comes out next Tuesday, a week today, 13th of December. Following day, Wednesday the 14th of December, the Federal Reserve will decide on interest rates. We're, everyone's betting on it being 50, 50 basis points now rather than 75 in the like of, light of what Jerome Powell said last week. Having said that, the Chinese ADRs, the Chinese stocks, are doing rather well. Yesterday, we had Alibaba up almost 1%, JD.com as well, Pinduda, the agricultural website, up well over 2%. And I see they're all up today with the exception of Pinduda. Only Xiaopeng was down yesterday. Xiaopeng is a car maker, and they had some pretty not very positive, not very strong November sales. So they were down sharply yesterday, but they're up 3% today, even though the, most of the market is down at the moment about those interest rate worries. A couple of other quick points for you. Meta platforms, which you know better as Facebook, down 5 to 6% at the moment. The reason is they're threatening to withdraw all news content from their site if the Congress goes ahead and passes a law which they people think it will pass regarding provision of local news. And uh, Meta Platform's also in trouble in the UK. Movement there today, uh, they're being sued over the collection of personal data. So their share price, it's down a lot. Five or six percent is quite a bit. Andrew? Social media, watch this space. John, always a pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Talk to you later. John Terry there in New York for us. <laughs> Well, do stay with us. Still ahead here on Global Business Europe. Hungarian supermarkets say they could be forced to cut jobs if government food price caps continue. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more... Just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we're trying to save the world. Oh, no. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Remember, CGTN is available to watch for free on all the major digital platforms on Smart TV or online on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. YouTube and Daily Motion, CGTN.com and the CGTN app. And in the UK, we're available 24 hours a day on Freeview. President Zelensky has visited troops in the eastern Donbass region, an area with heavy fighting with Russian forces. The Ukrainian leader talked to soldiers, presented some of them with medals at a position near the Donetsk front line. He also praised troops who are currently battling for the city of Bakhmut. Kiev's military intelligence chief says Russia has just enough high-precision missiles left for a few more large strikes before its stocks are depleted. Let's cross live now to our correspondent in Kiev, Shamim Chowdhury. So, Shamim, Kiev still without electricity after those Russian attacks on electricity power facilities. What more can you tell us about that? Well, this has been going on for coming up to two months now. Yesterday's strike was the eighth one since October the 2nd, and the Russians are directly uh, targeting critical infrastructure. In other words, electricity plants, gas and water supplies. 
These have been leaving around a third of the population without electricity at any given time. We're told that 70 missiles hit various parts of the country yesterday, 60 of which were deflected by air defense, uh, uh, air defense systems supplied by the U.S. Now, we understand that from the president's office that there were four fatalities, two of them in Zaporizhia, a number of injured, including a young uh, one-year-old child. Now, as you say, what happens at those moments when there are strikes is there is an emergency shutdown. That, we are told, is to ensure uh, that the uh, electricity companies can have some semblance of control as the missile strikes are taking place. In the immediate aftermath, telecoms engineers scramble to fix as much as they can, and then within a day or so, the country goes into scheduled power cuts, or at least large sections of the country. That means that around 6 million households have around between 3 and 4 hours of electricity on before it's switched off again, and it's a cyclic pattern. Now, authorities tell us they can expect this to last for the next 8 months or so, because they say that's how long it's going to take to fix the entire grid. And of course, of course, this is at a time when it is very, very cold here. It's already at least minus six in many parts of the country, and we can expect the temperature to drop further in the coming months. And Shamim, what's the latest on the fighting in the eastern and southern regions? Well, there's been heavy shelling, as we just heard, in Bakhmut. That's been going on for quite some time. That's in Donetsk region. The Russians, we are told, have encircled this town. It's a small town, but it's quite strategic, because if the Russians take it, it leads them to two highways, which they can then control, and then it means they can... Uh, 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 capture m uh, more of Donetsk. At the moment, they have about 50% or so. So that's ongoing. More firing from the east side of the River Dnipro, Zaporizhia, into, Zapor into uh, western sides of Dapor Zaporizhia regions, including Zaporizhia City, and also Kherson, again from the east, east side of the Dnipro, Dnipro into uh, uh, western parts of it, including Kherson City, which was retaken by the uh, Ukrainians back on the uh, 11th of November. There is fighting. It has slowed down on both sides. That was expected, largely because of the uh, drop in temperatures, but also because of issues with munitions and weapons, as we've just heard. Just one other thing that I want to mention, we are hearing from UNHCR of some numbers of uh, victims of this conflict. Uh, on the Ukrainian side, uh, the uh, UNHCR is saying that more, just over six million, uh, I beg your pardon, six thousand civilians have been killed, and around ten and a half thousand have been injured. However, they are saying that the real numbers could be much higher than this. This is based on the data that they have collected so far. A lot of the information, a lot of the t data is is uh, being collated quite slowly. There have been delays, so we can expect the numbers to be higher than that. Yeah, still very shocking figures. Shamim, many thanks indeed for that update. Shamim Chowdhury there live in Kiev. Russia says a third airfield has been hit by a drone attack in its western region of Kursk near the border with Ukraine. The regional governor says an oil storage tank was hit and caught fire. Our correspondent Stuart Smith is in Moscow. Stuart, these look like uh, they're becoming regular, these attacks. Yeah, indeed, the third one this week. This one was less large scale than the other ones. The one on Tuesday reported by the Kursk governor said, uh, according to the governor, only affected an oil tanker. It was a drone strike again, according to the governor, but he didn't say where it came from. But, it, and this, but that drone strike, as well as the two other ones that Russia blames on Ukraine, are starting to cause concern amongst the officials at the highest level of Russian politics. Vladimir Putin, the president, convened his National Security Council to discuss domestic, uh, domestic uh, problems, domestic concerns, and the Kremlin has characterized these attacks as terror attacks. The two drone strikes on Monday were particularly uh, concerning for the Kremlin because it showed that Ukraine had the ability to strike deep within Russia, hundreds of kilometers further uh, from the Ukrainian border than Moscow. And so that one in particular causing some alarm at the Ministry of Defense. They say those strikes on Monday killed three service personnel, injured four, and destroyed two long-range bombers, which Ukraine says were being used to attack its cities. But these bombers could also be used to carry Russia's nuclear deterrence. So a strategic hit, uh, that's very concerning for the MOD here.
And also, Stuart, stories doing the rounds that the Russians are trying to get certain individuals extradited out of Europe and that Interpol isn't playing ball. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's right. So an independent news media agency now based outside of Russia has seen two letters which it published on its website that show the uh, security officials and law enforcement officials discussing a rejection by Interpol, the organization that tries to coordinate extradition requests around the world. The Russian authorities, according to these letters, try to uh, seek help with extra extraditing four individuals charged over the new fake news about the Russian army forces law. Interpol said no, citing two reasons according to these letters. The first, that Interpol believes this is a politically motivated charge. The other being that none of the European Union member states where these individuals are suspected to reside have a similar law on their books, such as the law against spreading fake news about the Russian armed forces. So for that reason, it was denied. But it's hard to verify that because the Russian authorities won't say either way and Interpol doesn't comment on individual your cases. Stuart, thanks very much indeed. Stuart Smith in Moscow there for us. India says it will prioritize its own energy needs and continue to buy Russian oil. That's despite the price cap on Russian crude announced by the European Union and G7 nations on Monday in response to the Ukraine conflict. Russia is India's second largest supplier. Radhika Bajaj reports now from Mumbai. India's imports of Russian crude oil touched a record million barrels per day in November. The price cap of $60 isn't far from what India has been paying for Russian imports in recent months. If anything, more countries shunning Russian oil could be an advantage. The countries which continue to import uh, Russian oil, like India, China, some of the other uh, uh, emerging economies, I think it might give them a little more uh, negotiating leverage. The Russian Foreign Minister, uh, Sergei Lavrov, has also said that uh, Russia will continue to negotiate bilaterally. So far, shipping and insurance costs have been borne by the Russian side when selling oil to India. The new embargo on EU ships and insurance companies could pose short-term disruptions. But Russia has been working to find alternatives, including European vessels that are changing registrations to ship Russian oil and avoid losses. I think the shipping will come back, but insurance is far more closely guarded, particularly where you have large liability insurances. Uh, so there, if you don't, uh, don't use the European or the American reinsurers, then uh, the sovereign has to take a lot of uh, reinsurance. And I'm not sure whether countries beyond India and China have that capability. And even in these countries, I don't think sovereign is going to assume so much of a risk. Uh, so it really depends on how much Russia can cover this risk. As alternatives are worked out, India remains firm in prioritizing its energy security and will likely increase its oil imports from Russia. Experts say that if there's a reduction in export of Russian crude oil in the long term, it could lead to higher oil prices in the global markets. That could eventually be problematic for Western nations battling high inflation, something that India, in fact, has been able to mitigate by buying discounted Russian oil. Radhika Bajaj, CGTN, Mumbai. The global energy crisis is driving renewable energy forward at unprecedented speed. That's according to the International Energy Agency. The world is on course to add as much renewable power in the next five years as it has in the previous two decades. That's 30 percent ahead of last year's forecasts, according to the International Agency. It concludes energy security concerns caused by the Ukraine conflict are motivating countries to invest in renewables such as solar and wind at a much faster speed. Supermarkets in Hungary say the government's food price cap has been bad for business and that jobs will be cut if the scheme is extended. The caps on basic essentials were brought in after the conflict in Ukraine sent prices soaring, with Hungary's inflation now at a two-decade high. Our correspondent Pablo Gutierrez reports. It's been a challenging year for Hungary supermarkets since the government first capped the price of essential food items back in February. Stores have seen their profits dwindle. 
Since the food price cap was introduced, all supermarkets have been losing money. But smaller grocery stores in the city and the countryside are disproportionately affected. Attila Fodor heads communications for CBA supermarkets, which operates 2,000 stores in Hungary. He says the caps introduced by Prime Minister Viktor Orban are hurting the country and have failed to bring down inflation from its current level of 21 percent. He's worried about the long-term impact. More people will lose their jobs. The overall economy is affecting us. Budapest initially set a price cap on six basic staples, including sugar, white flour and chicken breast. Retailers weren't compensated. Then, using emergency powers, the government increased tax rates for big retailers from 2.7 percent to 4.1 percent. And now energy costs have soared, leaving grocery stores out in the cold this winter. We are now making losses on some price-capped products like sugar and sunflower oil. CBA won't reveal how much money it has lost this year, but other retailers are speaking out. Tesco Hungary says it has lost 28 million since the country capped food prices. And it isn't just essentials affected. Price regulation has artificially disturbed the market and it has inflated the prices of other products as well. In Hungary's second largest supermarket chain, this has led to near empty shelves and consumers scrambling to find and buy items on the government's food price list almost on a weekly basis. We are also stocking fewer products on our shelves. This is something we didn't do before the price cap. This is because some of those items are becoming more difficult to source from suppliers at the cap price. I hope we can survive. We are waiting to get some relief from the government, but that hasn't happened. Groceries are becoming harder to buy, with food inflation now at 27 percent. But the government is sticking to its approach and has now ordered milk, eggs and wheat flour to be added to the price cap list. Prime Minister Orvin hopes this will bring inflation down to single digits next year. Pablo Gutierrez, CGTN, Budapest. EU finance ministers are discussing whether or not to release $7.9 billion for fund, of funds for Hungary. It follows last week's call by the European Commission to freeze the funds due to Budapest's lack of progress on redressing rule of law concerns in the country. Meanwhile, Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban has vetoed a $19 billion loan to Ukraine, raising the stakes of the dispute and forcing other EU members to look for other ways to get financial aid to Ukraine. Still to come here on CGTN, expanding the union. European leaders meet to discuss the long-running cases of six potential new member nations. perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing, and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. 
Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? The difference is in the detail, in the background, defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Andrew Wilson and Paul Barber. The headlines again. China's capital opens up. Beijing becomes the latest city to ease COVID restrictions following Shanghai, Guangzhou and Chongqing. Visiting the front line, Ukraine's president travels to Donetsk amid heavy fighting in the east. And a large fire breaks out at a Russian airbase after it was hit by a drone attack. The third strike on a Russian airfield in two days. A memorial service for the late Chinese leader Zhang Zemin has been held in Beijing. Chinese President Xi Jinping and other senior officials attended the event and paid tribute to Zhang, who died last Wednesday at the age of 96. Chinese President Xi Jinping and other senior leaders gathered at Great Hall of the People on Tuesday morning to bid farewell to the late Chinese leader Jiang Zemin. The attendees paid a three-minute silent tribute to Jiang, who passed away on November the 30th in Shanghai at the age of 96. President Xi delivered a eulogy to mourn and pay respects to Jiang. Xi said Jiang Zemin was an outstanding leader, enjoying high prestige, acknowledged by the whole Communist Party of China, the entire military, and the Chinese people of all ethnic groups. He said Jiang was the core of the third generation of the party's central collective leadership, and a principal founder of the theory of three represents. President Xi said Jiang Zemin devoted his efforts to the Chinese people and to striving for national independence, the people's liberation, a prosperous and strong nation, and the people's well-being. Xi said the CPC Central Committee called on the whole party, the entire military, and the Chinese people of all ethnic groups to turn grief into strength and carry forward Jiang's legacy. Marxism is the fundamental thought that guides us to build and rejuvenate the party and the nation. The most valuable legacy that comrade Jiang Zemin has left us with is the theory of three represents. President Xi stressed the importance of upholding the theory of three represents. The theory of three represents is the guiding thought that the party needs to keep upholding in the long term. On a new journey, we must seek to integrate in the basic tenets of Marxism with China's specific realities and fine traditional Chinese culture. We must do things based on reality and keep answering the questions of China, of the world, of the people, and of the era. We must maintain the great liveliness and vitality of Marxism. President Xi also stressed the need to work together with the world and embrace a global vision. China's development is inseparable from the world, and the world's prosperity also needs China. Comrade Jiang Zemin stressed that we must follow the historical trend push for the establishment of new international political and economic orders that are fair and reasonable, strive for the long-term peace of the international environment, 
fully safeguard our national safety and interests and keep making new and greater contributions to the great mission of human peace and development. On a new journey, we must keep embracing a global vision, upholding peace, development, cooperation and mutual benefits, promote the common value of humanity, together push forward the high-quality development of the Belt and Road Initiative, push for the building of new international relations, push for the building of a human community with a shared future, and move forward together with all progressive forces around the world. At the end of the memorial, the attendees bowed three times to Jiang Zemin to pay tribute to him and express their high respects. A farewell to the late Chinese leader, who will be remembered for his historic role and inspired nation on the way forward. Iran has sentenced five people to death over the killing of a paramilitary volunteer. Prosecutors said Rahola Ajamian was killed by a group of mourners attending a funeral for a protester. Eleven other people, including three children, were handed lengthy jail terms. Tehran's been trying to crack down for months on nationwide anti-government protests since the death of Masa Amini in police custody. Voters in the U.S. state of Georgia are returning to the polls for the last outstanding Senate race of the midterm elections after neither major party candidate managed to secure over 50% of the ballot. Incumbent Democrat Raphael Warnock is facing Republican Herschel Walker in the tight runoff. This has drawn a record number of early voters. The Democrats are already in control of the Senate, but a win by Warnock could give the party more control to pass legislation. Activists in Indonesia have been protesting against a new law that makes sex outside marriage illegal. Protesters say the legislation unfairly targets women and members of the LGBT community. Lawmakers adopted the measures, which will see those found guilty sentenced to up to a year in jail. The law will apply to locals and foreigners alike. In a move some fear will discourage tourism. The British government is considering giving preventative antibiotics to school children to reduce the risk of strep A infections. Nine children have died since September from infections linked to the bacteria, while a higher number than usual have become very unwell. Some experts believe a previous lack of mixing due to COVID and increased susceptibility may be behind the severe cases. The population of Italy has fallen below 59 million and is aging faster than its fellow EU members. That's according to the country's National Statistics Agency. It's warning the population could fall by a fifth by 2070. The shrinking and aging populations linked to falling productivity, less innovation and higher welfare bills. And it's bad news for a stagnant economy like the one in Italy. European Union officials have arrived in the Albanian capital, Tirana, to meet leaders from the Western Balkans for talks on their long-running membership bids. Albania, Bosnia, Montenegro, Kosovo, North Macedonia and Serbia have all current applications in to join the EU, some dating back 18 years. The conflict in Ukraine has accelerated the EU's bid for expansion in Eastern Europe. Our correspondent Alex Cadier is live in Brussels for us. So Alex, these bids to join the EU, are they getting closer to being realised? Well, as you said, 18 years in the waiting for some uh, of these countries. And if you ask uh, how long is this going to take, how soon will these countries join the European Union, I'm afraid the answer is also going to be how long is a piece of string. It will depend. You've got six different countries at different stages of the, of the accession process, and it will be quite a long time coming, but this summit in Tirana is very much the EU's way of reaffirming its commitment uh, to the accession of these six countries to the European Union. That's obviously been accelerated, as you said, in the last few months, uh, a, a bigger desire for that to happen. But they are all at different stages and different and sometimes competing interests. Two of them, Serbia and Kosovo, have been at loggerheads uh, for months now over uh, new license plate rules in Kosovo. There have been talks mediated by the European Union. A deal finally struck between those two, but it would be quite a tricky thing to have two warring potential members of uh, the European Union joining. So there's a lot to be figured out. Albanian Prime Minister, who's hosting uh, this uh, summit, Eddie Rama, said, well, look, this is a, a, a test you can't cheat on. To getting into the European Union is something you've got to do properly and do well, and still more work is needed. And that's coming from the leader of a country that is uh, closer than, than some of the other uh, five to joining the European Union. So there would be very 
serious consequences and quite a lot of reforms still to be done by these countries uh, to get into the European Union. But that uh, summit, the first summit of its kind held, uh, held in a Western Balkan country, very much a sign that the European Union is still keen, if not entirely sure how, uh, to have these countries join the EU. And Alex, there's no getting away from it. The conflict in Ukraine has had a big impact on these bids. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Both uh, in the minds of the leaders of these six countries, they want to move away from Russia's sphere of influence and, and get closer to the European Union. There's no question about that. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the impact on the global markets have, been, uh, have impacted these countries negatively, and they want to have a closer relationship with the EU. There's also been an effect within the EU, more support for uh, the accession of these six countries to join the European Union as a result of this, uh, broadening the European Union's support, enlarging it, and having uh, stronger partnerships in that region. So more member states, which have previously been very opposed to the accession of these six countries, Western Balkan countries, they're warming up to the idea as a result of the invasion of Ukraine. But it has also been a bit of a stress test for uh, European decision-making, European institutions, and how decisions are made. Just today, as you've reported, uh, Hungary has blocked 18 billion euros going from the European Union to Ukraine because of a unanimous voting structure within the EU. The question there is, well, if we're bringing uh, six new and quite different countries into the EU, how will that affect uh, European decision-making process? So as much as there is a will uh, to do it and there's a will to have these countries uh, join and, and move away from Russia's sphere of influence, uh, still to be confirmed on the way to make that happen. Alex Cadier in Brussels. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, Morocco trying to break the hearts of their northern neighbour. They're playing Spain right now. We'll be in Qatar next. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Hello, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history. Far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So now we've actually become the border on this road. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control, the economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. The focus is family on future technologies. Well, this is something completely different. The world today, every day on CGTN. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. Spain are playing Morocco in the last 16 of the World Cup. The two countries are separated by just 13 kilometres of sea across the Straits of Gibraltar, and Morocco are hoping to pull off a surprise win. Well, let's join our correspondent, Dan Williams, live in Doha for us. Dan, good to see you. Uh, Morocco said they were confident of an upset. How likely is that looking so far? Well, yeah, it looks like we're edging to extra time at this rate. It's currently nil-nil uh, in this game. Uh, as you say, Spain heavily fancied to, uh, to win this one. Uh, but Morocco, I mean, they both, they both, uh, both sides have had chances to, uh, to take the lead. And uh, uh, it's still nil-nil, of course. Spain, they won it in 2010, but they haven't reached the quarterfinal since. So they're looking to take a significant step forward uh, here. Morocco, on the other hand, well, they've never reached a quarterfinal. Spain, they've uh, got off to a sensational start didn't they? 7-0 against uh, Costa Rica. But since then, they haven't really uh, performed too much, uh, too well. I mean, they uh, got a draw against Germany, they lost to Japan, uh, and so far, 0-0 against Morocco. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of pressure on Spain to live up to that uh, favourites tag. And what have we got next? Portugal versus Switzerland. Speculation about whether 
Christian Ronaldo could be dropped. Yeah, that's right. It's always uh, it's always about Ronaldo, isn't it? Um, whether it's for club or country, these two sides are evenly matched. Uh, Portugal number nine in the world, uh, Switzerland number fifteen. They're both they played each other twice this year. They've both won a, a game each. So uh, this is uh, yeah, it should be a very close game indeed. Uh, a very a very uh, closely. Uh, uh, fought match, um, but yeah, certainly with Ronaldo, um, he appeared. The, the the main incident where this surrounds is that he appeared to uh, to react angrily to being subbed off in the last game uh, against South Korea. He put his finger to his lips uh, and then seemed to yeah kind of react angrily thereafter. Uh, he says that it was just uh, it centered towards this uh, the South Korean player, but uh, it has led to speculation that he might be dropped. It might be that he lose the uh, the captaincy. We should find out shortly. Uh, the coach, uh, Fernando Santos, he says that it's been dealt with, but is unimpressed. This is what he had to say at a news conference uh, before this match. Did I see the pictures? Yes, and I didn't like them, not at all. I really didn't like them. And therefore, from that moment onwards, you have people commenting, but it's all over now. And the USA might be out of the World Cup, but I gather you've been speaking to one of the women's team players, and of course we've got the women's World Cup coming up next year. That's right. Yeah, we don't have long to wait. I mean, what we're you know into the pretty much into the quarterfinal stage of this World Cup, but yeah, just over what six seven months from. Now, the Women's World Cup, that kicks off in July in Australia and New Zealand. And Caterina uh, Macario, she's a Brazilian-born USA midfielder. USA have won uh, the World Cup back-to-back -back now. They're looking for a hat-trick uh, later next year. Uh, now, Macario, she says that she's confident that USA can do it, uh, but she says that uh, the women's football game is becoming more and more competitive. This is what she had to say when I spoke to her a little earlier. Of course. So that's... That's a dream, that's the expectation, uh, really. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're just expecting, you know, just to win it, of course. Not only that, but really just keep, uh, you know, growing the game and pushing the game forward. And I think, uh, I'm sure Australia and New Zealand will put in a, a good show and like set a, um, you know, just like the, the standard of what the future World Cups will look like. So I'm ex really excited for it. For you, I mean, I get, do you see the kind of the usual kind of contenders? Because we saw lots of shocks at this World mm -hmm, Cup, but yeah. do you see like, you know, the normal kind of contenders uh, at this World Cup, or you know, who do you see as your biggest threats? Um, I'd say England has been growing a lot. Yeah, I mean, England has always been there, really, but I, I, it's been really cool just to see them, um, obviously, with the Euros um, and like everything that they've been able to do, and like, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like they're definitely one of the teams to be. China also are going to be part of this World Cup. What are your expectations from them? Indeed, yeah. I mean, China always give, you know, everybody a run for their money. And, I mean, that's, I, I hope that, you know, like more and more teams can do that. And it's not just like, oh, the big teams, and like the big nations as before. Um, even, you know, like we'll, we'll get to play Vietnam, and I think that will be a good game. So um, I hope, you know, like, more and more teams can keep um, that standard up, you know, so that it's not necessarily just like a, um, something that you expect, like someone will win, you know, and um, I think China is always like really at the top. So, yeah, I'm hoping to play them, of course, one day. Yeah, Katerina Macario, they're talking, of course, the Women's World Cup, that gets underway next year. But, of course, the focus now is on the Men's World Cup and uh, one game going on right now, Spain up against Morocco, currently nil-nil, going now into extra time, that one. Wonder if we get penalties uh, once again here at this World Cup. Indeed. Nice one, Dan. Thanks very much indeed. Dan Williams there in Doha for us. Well, quite a few big teams have taken a downhill turn in Qatar and slid out of the tournament. Well, in the slightly colder climes of Urumqi in China's Xinjiang Autonomous Region, people have been getting back onto the ski slopes as COVID measures are eased. Our correspondent Zheng Songwu reports. It's been a cold winter in Xinjiang, and the ski resorts in its capital, Urumqi, are open for ski lovers now that the COVID-19 pandemic is easing. This is a Silk Road ski resort, and it's open for the first time this winter. This is the first snow season in Rumchi since the Beijing Winter Olympics. We have upgraded the pistes and increased their area. 
We have also equipped our resort with a Winter Olympic gray snow making system and snow pressing facilities to ensure snow quality for ski lovers. It's my first time skiing this winter. The facilities at this resort are very good, and the staff here also follow COVID-19 rules very well, so we are at ease having fun here. At the International Grand Bazaar in Rumqi, merchants disinfected the environment and restocked their goods as they prepared to receive visitors. We removed and disposed of all the expired products safely. Now we have enough goods like raisins and other Xinjiang specialties. We also disinfect our store at least twice a day, and customers must scan the QR code before their visit, which can keep everyone safe. Urumqi has also issued new policies to help businesses resume operations. So far, there are over 28,000 enterprises and small businesses that are operating normally. In one of them, a food production and a processing company, nearly 70% of the workers have been at work, and the bread produced there is being delivered to the markets in the city. We are likely to operate our second and third production lines at full capacity in seven days, by that time, our company will be at full capacity producing and selling products. Urumqi will help more enterprises resume their operations by issuing exclusive policies that will support the provision of raw materials and help workers return. Zheng Song, CGTN. From janitor to CEO, certainly a meteoric career rise, but the boss of the world's biggest cruise ship trade association says anyone can reach the top from humble beginnings. That's right. Kelly Craighead told Global Business that, that, business that her first job taught her how to sell a travel experience to customers. So I was really fortunate when I graduated from the university to be able to work for a destination management company in San Francisco. So one of the things that I had the great privilege of doing was bringing clients on site visits, on tours of what we would potentially then offer for their clients. So one of the greatest challenges I had to overcome was really how do you host a visit to the wine country as a young person, make sure your guests are having a good time, but that you yourself are not having too good of a time. So it took a little trial and error, but I was able eventually to master how to host a wine tour by people buying corporate incentives. Travel and tourism is one of the most exciting segments of the economy anywhere in the world. So my advice to young people starts before they start at university. And my advice then is to really look at tourism as a career. You know, I think one in 10 jobs are created from travel and tourism. So whether you're working for a restaurant, whether you're working for a ground operator, whether you're working for a hotel, or whether you're on a cruise ship, or supporting the visits of visitors to a destination, these are incredibly exciting jobs that really allow you mobility to move. So you might start, as we've seen in some of the sessions at the World Travel and Tourism Conference Summit, that you can start as a janitor, you could start as a bellhop, but then you end as a CEO. And that's one of the most exciting things about travel and tourism is there really is something for everyone when it comes to employment. For more on that, check out CGTN's social media accounts and search for My First Job. Our top stories again. China's leaders pay tribute to Jiang Zemin at a memorial for the late president in Beijing. Visiting the front line, Ukraine's president travels to Donetsk amid heavy fighting in the east. And a large fire breaks to the Russian air base after it was hit by a drone attack, the third strike on a Russian airfield in two days. And that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. We're on Smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Android TV, YouTube and Daily Motion, CGTN.com and the CGTN app. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place, from all the team in London. Goodbye. Bye-bye.